So, Bob Barfield, one word to describe your dinner here with us. Uh, food was good. And now for Dinner with Racers, presented by Continental Tire. With your hosts, Ryan Eversley and Sean Heckman. Placeholder Radio All right, welcome once again to Dinner with Razors. I'm Sean Heckman. I'm Continental Tire. Or Ryan Eversley. I mean, I'm Ryan Eversley. If uh, you don't know who we are, fine, let's move on. Uh, we are coming here somewhere between Florida and Atlanta. Exit 390. Headed home on October 31st, 2015. This is wrapping up a cross-country trip where uh, we've had in uh, your lovely Acura. MDX. And uh, this has some, some what tires? I believe they are Continental tires. Uh, anyway, so we met up with a ton of people in racing that we thought would be interesting to talk to. We invited them to dinner and kind of this is the result. There were, we didn't have an agenda, we didn't have a structure. Some of them we didn't know. Uh, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Continental tires. And uh, how many miles on them Contis? 8,000. All right, 8,000 miles, 30 days we've traveled across. 20 states. And uh, 27 meals was the result. All for you to listen to and tell us what idiots we are. Continental Tires. So next edition is the great Bo Barfield. We traveled out to Houston, Texas. This is actually our first home interview that we did. Um, we ate at the famous Bo's Bar and Grill, which is in fact his backyard. So here's the thing about Bo Barfield. Um, if you don't know his career, Bo is currently the race director at the uh, IMSA WeatherTech sports car championship one of those jobs that no one wants Bo has been a race director for a variety of series over the years currently with IMSA but but was sort of the big dog at IndyCar for a couple years kind of got his uh cut his teeth in Atlantic yeah he did Atlantic he did a uh, continental tire series while he's been at IMSA and we got to show up at the place and there's like five people hanging out yeah he had like an entourage they're playing guitars and, and live music and we didn't really know what we were getting into we ended up having dinner delivered from Hungry. Hungry's, which Bo apparently worked at when he was in high school. I had the Chipotle chicken wrap. And I had a chicken sandwich. Of course you did. So uh, let's listen to Bo. Thanks once again to Continental Tire. Continental for, Tire. For getting us there. Meow. Meow. All right, we're going to start in five, four, three, two. So... Uh, so your, we've got your, your place is awesome. Yeah, like, what's this, is this like Bo's Ranch? Is there a name for Bo's it? Bo's Bar and Grill. Bo's Bar and Grill. That's awesome, dude. I love <laughs> yeah. the golf sign. I got a golf sign at home myself. And then, uh, yeah, Did I didn't you, realize you had the pool and everything too. That's that's pretty killer. Yeah, yeah. when I uh, I have a history of uh, breaking into places before I buy them. Okay. And this was the third place um, that I broke into without a realtor before I bought it. And so I came around back, and th it was in foreclosure for about a year and a half. And when I walked around to the back, um, the pool was covered because it was just in a state of disarray. Right. And that, and the sunroom um, is where I got in. But I walked into the sunroom, and I saw the pool, and I thought I knew this was going to be my place. Now, was it was for sale on the market? It was. It okay. Just, uh, <laughs> I was driving around to. <laughs> you know, just breaking in, <laughs> yeah. like, oh, okay, can I have yeah. a hey, was. Yeah. I got a gun. What's your and price? A check. What's your price? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, none of that. None of that. No, it, it actually. Uh, I was uh, touring this side of town, like I told you earlier. I, this is my old stomping ground. So uh, when I, this place, the first day it came on the market, I saw it online, right. and I made it mine. So we walk in, and I'm like, no shit. He's got like four friends that are playing guitar. Is this is this Sunday night here? Oh, yeah. This nice. Is, this is normal. I mean, that, ever since I've known you, though, that's how it's been. Like, your house has always been like, you know, the, hey, come over, we'll play some cards yeah. or some sim, sim on the computer or something. And yeah, Do you actually, do you have a sim here? Negative. Okay, so I was telling Sean, and I couldn't remember whose chassis it was, but for the backstory, uh, we used to go over to Bo, Bo's house. He, Eric Foss was a roommate of his at the time. And you had a sim set up downstairs with an actual F2000 chassis mm -hmm. that had been totaled. Was it Oberto's? Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay, so Larry Oberto exactly right. had yep. a huge <laughs> crash at Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Everybody thought he was, you know, going to be really mangled up, and he was okay in the end, sort of. Yeah. And uh, he uh, that chassis was in your basement 
like still kinked. Well, Mike Johnson was running the car, and we were all, you know, we were all buddies at the time. Yep. And the, before they put the fire out on that thing, I was like, oh, how do I get, how do I get simulator. that? I live right <laughs> up the road. Is. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> and when they stripped it, it was out back of Mike's shop. I was like, are you going to do anything with that? He's like, no. I said, it's gone. Cool. Yeah. Just Don't expect it to be here tomorrow. Yeah. And this is like early, mid-90s before like simulated. It was late 90s. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We used to play uh, Grand Prix Legends on it. And that was like the game. Yeah, you know, it's right. still the game. Yeah, but that I remember that was like the ticket. So we were uh, we hit up Eric Foss a while back to to kind of see. Uh, we're like, what's what's some good some good bow dirt? And uh, he's like, ask him about showing up to the mall and uh, seeing somebody on the sim or on uh, race driving. Yeah, that that was That's the right. arcade game, right? Yeah. And he said that he would show up and you'd already be on it, and he would know to go home because that was a game you could keep going. If you did well? Yeah, if you were good, you could just keep doing lap after lap after lap until you were just tired of it. Right. And so if I'd show up and he was there, it'd be like, oh, i got to go There's get lunch or something. Yeah. Um, and if he'd show up and I was there, it was kind of the same thing. But he and I became buddies. That was like 1992. Sure. Yeah. And so now he, you know, he's last year's champion in ST and currently, you know, in the series that one of the, you know, you manage and keep an eye over. Is that weird having to watch us race and, like, see us do stupid stuff and – have to give us penalties or warnings or <laughs> it's um you know the funny thing is about stuff like that is um i i try not to ask i so i say i try and therefore at times i do but i try not to ask the beauty of endurance racing is there's two drivers in a car and so i i barely know car numbers on purpose and so i i rarely ever ask who's driving that car who's in the car um for that reason because who's driving doesn't matter it's all just at face value you look at an incident who's driving doesn't really matter with the exception of somebody that might be on probation or have really bad history um but i mean i've told i've told guys like um like ed brown in the past he and i kind of became buddies when he was uh when he was running in GT3, and then obviously he, he moved into uh, ALMS at the time and then Tudor now. Um, I had told him a long time ago that, um, you know, people know that that we're kind of close, and therefore they immediately will have the perception that uh, you might get away with stuff. And therefore, for my way of thinking, if it's even close with you, I'm going to penalize your yeah. ass because yeah, you've I'm just going to make the statement. Yeah. And that's kind of the same way I feel about uh, about whether Eric Foss is the example right now, sure. uh, right. the guy's been a, a guy of his uh, skill and talent, totally off the radar. I've never had to deal with anything right. that he's done on track. So that's the comfortable situation uh, for me or the part of it for me is that uh, the guys that I know well, that I've spent so much time that have made a career out of this, doing it for 20 plus years, they're completely off my radar anyway. So it's kind of a moot point. Yeah, copy that. Does that sort of go the other way where maybe curtails you from becoming friends with guys you haven't met? Um, I don't, uh, I don't necessarily try to buddy up to too many people at the track. Sure. Um, so in terms of, uh, friendships or personal relationships, it's kind of just a, a, it's a non-issue. Sure. Sure. So Sean doesn't know much about your background. I have a little bit more information just from knowing you for so long, but just talk us through the first like five years of you getting started in racing. Cause I don't think you did carts. I don't remember if you did carts. I did carts. You did carts? Okay, I did yeah. carts. Foss I, couldn't remember either. Yeah, so I, my dad was racing when I was a little kid. He was always a car guy. He was always into it, and I was way more into it than he was. I knew everybody and everything about racing. And that was in the Atlanta area? No, that was right here in Houston. Houston. Okay. Yeah, yeah. right here. Um, actually, is this was, where you grew up? Yeah, I grew up real close to here. Uh, this is kind of the epicenter of where I grew up and went to um, elementary school, middle school, high school. Was all in. And uh, actually, this road um, that's just on the other side of this building behind my house, when they first paved it and it was not open to the public yet, I used to rock it down <laughs> there on my go kart. <laughs> and so, Enclave Parkway is is what it's called. It, I blazed a trail down there on my go kart back in the day when I was tuning it and getting ready when I was 11, 12 years old. Nice. Um, so my dad was racing. I was into it. I started racing carts when I was 12. Actually uh, did kind of some outlaw races um, in his cars when I was 15. And then when I was old, when I finally turned 18 and I was old enough, I started racing in SCCA. Okay. 
And that was like open wheel stuff. You, you I did some spec racer, then I did Formula Four 2000. The cool thing about when I did Formula Four 2000 is there was actually three pro series. The uh, second year I did it, there was a USAC series, which is really now the USAC series and the SCCA series are really kind of the what combined it to uh, create the current USF 2000 championship. Um, but there were two of those, so kind of pick and choose the good races to go to. And then yeah. there was also. Um, new for 94, um, the Hooters series. Right. The, the owner of Hooters started this series that was stock cars and Formula Ford 2000s on small ovals in the southeast, and that's where I really, um, I don't know, uh, had the best success of all of my driving. And this is mid-'90s, right? So the, the crop of guys that came through at that time is pretty crazy. Yeah, and in, in, uh, in 94 and 95 and Formula Ford 2000, um, I could list off guys, but I remember in the in the Hooter series, um, Anthony Lazaro, he won the championship and I was second. He won four of the races. I won three. Um, who else was in there? Um, Greg Tracy, who now does yeah. a bunch of stunt driving and yeah. commercial yeah. stuff. He won Off-road, a race. Off-road guy, too. Yeah. Er- stuff Erna- like. Ernest Sykes was a really good friend of mine in Atlanta. He was He actually was paralyzed temporarily thankfully in a in an accident the year before hmm. at uh, road atlanta right in front of me actually which is where he always was <laughs> and the way eric described it was like you didn't show up as some hired gun with some other pro team and you were you were trailing your own cars and wrenching on your own cars and, and kind of making it all work there's a guy named paul taylor who's uh who's a head mechanic on uh, on the delta wing now yeah and he was literally fresh off the boat from england they showed up at Primus Racing, who were the uh, importers of Van Diemen at the time. Hmm. And uh, he was just kind of one of those guys that Ralph Furman would send over a few years, go to the U.S. and check it out. And now 20-some-odd years later, Paul's still here. But he's the guy that I kind of inherited and get, gave whatever money I could every week so he could just eat and survive in the U.S. Wow. And he and I literally would load that thing up. We'd prep it all hours of the day and night, load it up, and head off to the races. So it was literally a two-man show. The beauty of it back then is that uh, we could do a race for probably about three or four grand, and uh, it was ten thousand to win. Yeah, wow. we ac- we actually made money that year, just him and me, just cruising around the country. That's awesome. That's cool. <laughs> Partying, racing, and whatever. You, used to, you did really well in the ovals, if I recall. Yeah. So you're obviously getting to meet Hooters girls for Trophy Girls. Is that what they were doing back it then? It happened. Yeah. So okay, so that was probably a pretty nice way as a young guy to kind of get some dates. Very yeah. Yeah, probably made it pretty easy. <laughs> yeah, it happened. Yeah. How he quiets down during that moment. He's like, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> I don't know why he's giving me that weird face. Um, so you go from uh, Hooters, which is basically now the F2000 series, and right. you get to do some Indy Light stuff, and that was kind of where your career as a driver slowed down. Mm-hmm. Now, is it one of the typical tales of motorsports where, you know, just the money wasn't there and you ri- writing's on the wall? Or a, a great part of, you know, being involved, the people you meet and, and just the acquaintances that you keep over the years is working at Road Atlanta forever, which is a part of the story that was kind of missed. But um, at some stage during my driving career, just to stay around racing, I moved to Atlanta to yeah. start teaching the school there. And um, the, the years that I started doing Formula Ford 2000, um, a driver showed up at Road Atlanta for the runoffs by the name of Lynn Breesley. And uh, she was she was a heck of a driver, and I did some coaching with her. Got to know her, got to be really good friends with her. And her, her dad happened to be um, a, a part owner in a small IndyCar team. And he was kind of done being a partner and wanted to have his own program, so he started in in Indy Lights program the following year and that was the same that was the year after I had all that success in Formula 4 2000 and on the ovals so he brought me in to drive for him and we did uh, I only ended up doing two races before he figured out that uh, he didn't need to have some broke kid like me in the car (laughs) and found some money and I I was out and uh, after that and a lot of oval experience and we did a lot of testing on ovals in the Indy Lights car and I, I loved it and I just took to it so I was working on just getting an Indy 500 deal together yeah. and it just it just never played out and I kind of got over it and decided I love racing I've been around it all my life I need to find other things to do right and not too long thereafter is when the officiating stuff kind of just fell into my lap and you've I mean you've been fortunate enough to make a career in racing still past the driving part but but obviously you're able to race with a lot of good guys and beat a lot of good guys but it sounds like you didn't come from a lot of money um, does, do you ever look back and see some of the guys you're able to race with and, and kind of, ah, I could get that guy? Or? 
you know, there was that for a while. You see people that you know you could beat, and they're on track. And then you have to you have to look at racing and appreciate um, its business virtues over its sport virtues, and realize that you know people that have the means are the business savvy to make deals happen. That's really what it's more about. And I saw too many people that I worked with or I was close to that got completely dragged down in the negativity of bitterness yeah. of people that they raced with that, that went on further than they did. And I didn't want to let that negativity or bitterness get me down. And so I just stayed motivated to allow my career path to take me wherever it would end up going. I knew from the time that I was growing up not far from here when I was five, six, seven years old that that's all I wanted to do. Right. So now I can look back at the last 30 years of my life and what I've been doing and what I always wanted to do and say it's been absolutely <laughs> successful. So I guess people, you know, I mean, most people know you for the race officiating. They know... Some people know about the driving history, but there was this whole Atlanta period where you were with the schools and, and sort of making ends meet. Kind of where was this in sort of the career path? So once the Indy Lights thing came to an end, which was 1995, I hate to say the last time I competed in a race was actually 20 years ago. <laughs> so um, that, I, like I kind of said earlier, I knew that I just wanted to stick with whatever came my way and stay involved around it. So at that point, I took to being um, really active in teaching, um, did a lot of coaching, and did a lot of data uh, data coaching for sure. guys back in those days. Sure. And um, really, in continuing to teach, there was a, there was a great program that they had at Mid Ohio, which was uh, the Mid Ohio School, which was founded by Michelle Truman and Chris Neifel. Sure. And when I w went to work for Chris Neifel the first time, he and I just completely completely jived and you're in Ohio at this point so I would travel up to Ohio just to teach schools and uh, they would they would bring in what I what I thought what well it what certainly was a pretty stellar group of guys to, to work together we had a great time and uh, in the school and and uh, spending time together up there in Ohio but uh, Chris and I really took to each other we became really good friends and we worked really really well together we just agreed on a lot and saw eye to eye on everything and He'd go way out of his way to help me. I'd go way out of my way to help him. And uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't long thereafter that, uh, to me at the time, it seemed completely out of nowhere that uh, IndyCar at the time, or maybe it was the iteration that ended up becoming Champ Car, came after him to be the race director. Right. And when he did that, and I thought... this is 96, this, this, was, this was actually, so uh, 95, okay. uh, 95, 96. So it's just as the split is happening. Well, 95, 96, 97 is okay. when I really spent the time coaching, teaching, doing data acquisition. 97 was the first time I went to Mid-Ohio. And uh, we worked together for quite a while because he was driving. He soon thereafter, actually sooner thereafter, I should say, '98 is when he when the Corvette program started. Oh, cool. and he was one right. of the first drivers That's for right. that. Yeah, That's right. So he went off and did that, and I kind of took over, really uh, being more involved in in what his role had been sure. at the Mid Ohio School, which he was the chief instructor. So he knew he could leave you to administer things. He, yeah, and he more or less did. And there was a lot more to that story than that. But that's kind of the way it played out just in looking at the timeline. And then in 2001 is when he literally turned his back on the Corvette program. He, he, he opted out to go become the race director of IndyCar at the time. Right. And when he did that, I thought, hmm, that's kind of interesting. And uh, funny enough, in 2002 guy that I'd driven for, I mentioned Primus Racing, John yeah. Betos, bought the Formula Ford 2000 series, funny enough, from the Andersons, who now own it again, <laughs> yeah. but he, he took it over, and as soon as he did, he called me and said, I need a racer to be the race director, right. and I want you to be that guy, and so Chris Neifel, IndyCar race director, um, 2001, I was race director of Formula Ford 2000 in 2002, and right. after that one year of experience, he hired he me into in. Champ Car wow. into 2003, is and that it took it off from there. Is that a normal deal where somebody has the wherewithal to go, oh, maybe our race director should be a racer? Uh, because it seems like it, you know as some series don't always do that, and I'm sure there's good and bad to both directions, but it seems clear with you. Yeah, I, there was definitely a movement at the time. Obviously... Um, IndyCar at the time, Wally was getting to the point where he, he had basically threatened retirement for about three or four years in a row and was looking for a replacement. Right. And, you know, his, uh, his uh, racing... This is, with the old, this is with Champ Car at the time. Yeah, Champ yeah. Car would right. probably be a better way to refer to it because at that time there was an IndyCar. Um, his, his racing 
experience was probably a little bit too far in the past and they wanted somebody more current sure, sure. and you know they needed frankly they just needed somebody younger yeah. and uh chris to his credit stayed really dialed in with the powers that be in that organization kind of unknown to me at the time right but uh, he positioned himself well and uh it, they thought he was a natural and he certainly was and he did a good job and um to your the to your question there was definitely a movement at that time pretty strong and pretty public in a lot of different series to find officials and race directors that had a lot more current driving experience and therefore find younger guys to f fill those roles. Sure. I don't think that the, the beauty of my job is that there's nobody putting their hand up to say, I want that job. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of things that I've done, whether it's driving or teaching or chief instructor where guys will stab Everybody you in the back because they want your job. Right. And here I'm totally safe. I don't even need to, I don't even need to look over my shoulder because <laughs> right. nobody wants to do the shit I do. That's a great point. I haven't thought of that at all. <laughs> and, and, and just in that regard, when I sure. was first asked to do it, I thought there's nobody that does this. It's unique. It's different. Yeah. It's, it's something that I think I can grasp and do, and nobody wants this job, so it's all me. Now, do you think because you're a known figure in the sport, you, you have a racing background as a driver, that it might hurt you in terms of, I mean, I know you have really thick skin, so you're not too concerned with criticism, but it's almost, in my mind, sometimes it would be smarter if we didn't know who they were, because then you wouldn't know who to bitch about on Twitter, Instagram, whatever, with uh, Bo Barfield did this, and you know the guy's an idiot, he's got to get fired, as we've heard from IndyCar drivers that then two years later praised you when you left to go to another series. And if they didn't know who the one w person was making the direct call, who do you complain about? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's it's a, it's a complicated answer because I think that it, 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 the whole situation that you describe is certainly complicated this day and age with social media because, yeah, right. you know, people – people have the information they want more information they're starving for it they love this sport they want to yeah. know who everybody is and they're going to figure it out and they're going to know um i think trying to remain somewhat anonymous while unrealistic is um is noble but it's not going to happen um i don't you know i don't give a crap what people say right. about my calls right. and and what their opinions are everybody has an opinion i watch football and i question every officiating decision that i see <laughs> just because it's fun um, so I get it, but in terms of people trying to get inside my head and understand what I'm thinking at the time right. that a call or a decision is made, the, most people, with all due respect, are completely clueless to uh. what goes <laughs> into those reviews and those calls. Well, it, it, and probably my best example of that is uh, 2011 Edmonton IndyCar race. Brian Barnhart gets in the driver's meeting and says, if you cross this line on a right. defensive maneuver, you will get black flag. Right. And at the end of the race, Elio crossed that line in a defensive maneuver yep. and he penalized him. Yep. And so the really probably the bigger question w when we get into officiating philosophy is that when he made that call, it was unanimously accepted by the drivers in the right. paddock. It was a great call. Brian's a great, great race official. He takes a beating, but I got nothing but full right. respect for that guy. It was unanimously rejected by the public. Right. So as officials, you have to look at what do you want the on-track product to be? What right. do you want to call? How involved do you want to be in the competition? Right. And I think when you ask those simple questions, the answers become infinitely clear on how races should be called. Right. Well, and there's sort of two philosophies that come to, that come at stake here. There's there's the, 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 the public questioning the rule, but that's not what your guys' job is. Your job and is to officiate that and rule. And, and, and so, and yeah. my point to that really, to, to just wrap it all up, right. is that Brian said exactly what he was going to do right, in the driver's right. meeting, and nobody publicly took that information and said, you know what, for what was said in the meeting, he that was absolutely rule. the right call. Right. It was just their opinion that drove right. that that drove it. Well, and, and, and back in the IndyCar day, you used to always say uh, that it was a good day for you if you weren't part of the headline. And uh, and like I think about uh, you know in the year that we just wrapped up in 2015. Uh, Circuit of the Americas, which has a ton of runoff room, ton of pavement, um, very easy for a driver to go wide that sort of exceeds the boundaries of the track. Uh, and I think you guys, in a bold decision, said, you know what? We don't want to have to be part of this storyline. We'll just say you're not going to, 
you know, we're not going to officiate that or we're not going to restrict that. Um, and it seems to me like that's part of the consciousness of what you guys are doing is making sure that that if you don't have to enforce a rule, you'll make sure that it's, it's the way it should be. Well, it has to be logical. I mean, right. my frustration going into CODA is I knew that if we did away with track limits that it would look kind of silly on TV. Right. <laughs> and that's ultimately <laughs> what the perception was, right, is it right, didn't right. look right. Yeah. right. And I knew that going in, but really before you write a rule or before you stand your ground or before you draw a line, no pun intended, to say you can't cross this line, yeah. you better be damn sure that you can enforce it. And you right. can enforce it strongly and, and consistently. consistently. Yeah. And, you know, people, I've seen people say it was a cop out, it was lazy. Uh, I'll tell you, absolutely, we did not have the means to officiate absolutely. that in one, two, three, four, five or six places around the track right. that we had to enforce it. So the five guys that are running nose to tail, four of them do it right and one does it yeah. wrong and gets a little bit of an advantage and we miss it, then what does well, everybody that, say? Everybody exactly says, it. screw it. And then the wrong guy ends up getting penalized and it's controversy. We yeah. completely, as a series, removed ourselves from the competition and let it play out on track. And yeah. that by itself, all on its own, stripped down to its purity, is my officiating philosophy. Absolutely. Well, we were talking about how we both agreed with that decision Ooh. for exactly that reason. And we saw but the next day in the WEC race where they tried to enforce it. They, they had left, right, and center. Yeah. The, 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 uh, part of my... Uh, part of my validation for that was is that so many WEC drivers came up to me personally to say you guys are doing the right thing because we're getting screwed because they can't officiate it right. right. They're right. making the threats they and they're acting like they can but they can't. Right. And I could see that three days before it happened that if we made that threat there was no way and they have they've actually created technology within their film and timing and scoring software to to try to officiate it. So basically they've said that well we've got a lame track no, no offense, Fair but there enough. it is. <laughs> yeah, I don't we yeah. we have a lame track that has these, um, you know, these huge runoff areas where it's yeah. difficult to define or enforce um, track limits. So rather than go and fix those tracks, right. um, the FIA or the WEC has said, well, let's implement this program to officiate that. Well, wait, you don't write rule, you know, you don't write rules. Um, on top of rules is basically yeah, what yeah. it amounts to. Uh, they need to go fix the problem, sure, not right. try to officiate what the problem is. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with that. And I think most of the drivers in the, in the IMSA paddock were pretty happy with it because in years prior when they tried to enforce things like that at different tracks, like let's say the exit of turn one at Watkins Glen, that's always a big, big question mark. Um, it was like, who got away with what? Yep, food's here. Hey, man. So we ordered from Hungary's Cafe, yeah, which is like a local spot for you. It is. There's some significance there too, actually. Let's hear it. I worked as a waiter at this restaurant when I was in high school. No way. It's the oh, really? It's the only. It's the only job I've had outside of motor racing. Wow. <laughs> so it's the last job you had outside of motor racing. Which, what did you do there? I was a waiter. Oh, you're waiting tables. Yeah. My Look. last. My last job before racing was uh, I was a cook in probably a place a little similar to yeah. this. Yeah. And you keep a relationship with him. Yeah, re really good friends with the owners. Well, good, it's good, good to have guys. a fallback if it doesn't work. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, this officiating well, thing didn't pan out yeah, for me. I still got a relationship well, I mean, wait, there. Did, did you leave or did they fire you? Um, I left. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So you're probably okay. Yeah, there was you know, some other waiters like, this guy should be fired. <laughs> like, I don't two know years if later. Uh, we're not sure if you're hungry as material, know, who, but any car will probably that. take you. So one thing you kind of alluded to earlier is I give you a lot of credit because – Twitter has kind of, and, and Facebook and Instagram or whatever, they've all kind of opened up this this new opportunity for fans to engage and be part of the, the process like, like never before, which you want to say is inherently good, but uh, the downside of that, in my belief, is that we've got this new kind of uh, uh, clinging to relevance that, that fans will have where they, they want to be part of the, the, the conversation, whether they, they understand what's going on or not. And where I give you a lot of credit is that you have this amazing way to step in front of that um, but in a way that I laugh, you know, like somebody will say like, oh, Bo Barfield did this. And you'll reply and be like, oh, here I am. So say something. Um, yeah, I, I like that. I used to say a long time ago, I don't, um, I don't delete the haters. I retweet them. <laughs> and that, that really pisses people off. Oh, yeah. Which, which that's is been, yeah, that's absolutely. been my MO since I got onto Twitter. It's like, no, let's talk about it. My, my problem with it is the difficulty that I have is there's such a, there's such a butthurt politically correct society 
somebody will just kick you in the balls while you're down. And sure. if you say one thing that can be construed in a way that somebody's offended, how oh can man, I use this against it's you? It's hell to pay. Yeah. Right. And so I've completely removed myself from it, and it's a shame because there was a time when I first got to IndyCar that my boss, to his credit, Randy Bernard at the time, he completely embraced within reason my activity on social media and it was a good way to connect with the fans and give explanations and like you say just kind of stay ahead of it yeah and then you know you say one or two things and people get upset and then it's like i can't go there anymore so the reality is i watch and i'll say a few things but even now my powers that be don't necessarily they're okay with me being bo barfield but they're not okay with me being on twitter as a race director yeah, that makes and it's sense. kind of frustrating because there's so many things, like you said, again, that you can kind of get ahead of, and you could kind of just put some explanations out there, but it's just it, it's, it's not all part of it's it. not worth it. Yeah, exactly. It's part of a controlled message they're trying to. to put so, out. kind of going down that social media thing, uh, we're just getting past the season finale at Petit Le Mans, and uh, sort of a controversial race just because of the weather was so terrible, and that track itself has, you know, a lot of elevation, a lot of rolling hills, which creates you know rivers, and I think you guys. I can't think of another time I've seen a race director go out on track during a situation like that and then have trenches dug on the side of the race to direct water, which I was like, well, that's, you know, that's pretty cool. Instead of just giving up, they're, they're literally trying to move the earth to fix the race. And then uh, you just couldn't, you know, it is what it is. It was pretty nasty. A lot of cars are getting wrecked, and you guys call it. Two questions. Number one, why was there no white flag? Because I just don't know. Like, it, from what I understand, it was like, okay, checker. For anyone who's asked me how that race ended, why it, why it ended, I got a simple answer. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, don't worry about it. Good enough for me. Second, now, now the the <laughs> the reality is, um, for me, we needed to maintain the integrity of the competition, sure. and so we we had a lot to deal with before we could throw the checkered flag. And a lot to deal with means you're circulating behind the safety car, and circulating behind the safety car, people are running out of fuel. Not opening the pits, people are wondering what you're doing. Or maybe they shouldn't be, because ultimately, for right. me, if I would have opened the pits, for example, it would have lured a lot of people in that thought we were going to restart. Right. So we, we maintain the integrity of the competition, because I knew, and looking ahead, that if we get a full course yellow, which I, I'm just waiting for it to come based yeah, right, on the right, trend right. of the day, if we get a full course yellow in this magic window... Um, of what I'm seeing on radar and we're losing daylight, then visibility with the current conditions on track with the rain coupled with the lost daylight, there's no way in good conscience I'm going to restart this race. Right. And therefore, there's no way I'm going to restart the race. Right. So I'm just, I don't get micromanaged. I'm empowered to do my job and that's what I love most about where I am right now. Mm. Um, but there's a lot of people that need to know before I do that. And meanwhile, as all that's getting aligned and in place, and oh, by the way, now the podium needs to be ready. Say, so to interpret this, the, you need to set up the podium part of the deal. And, we, the and, podium and needs to be set up two and a half hours yeah. early. Right. So, I, And meanwhile, I'm getting instant messages. Are you going to open the pits? Why aren't you opening the pits? Right. We're running out of fuel. And I'm thinking, okay. And, and to, just to put that in context, there's an instant message system that all the teams in the yeah. paddock have the right to race control going, what's up, or well, I don't want to have this penalty, or whatever. So it's a way to communicate directly with the tower without having to go to an official for every issue. Yeah, and, and, I, and yeah. I, I was a part of that early on when we introduced it, like, uh, eight years ago in or America so. In America, right. Um, is, so there was a lot to get in order, and as soon as I got every last person informed and there was no more homework or side work to do it was checkered flag time so you're literally and spending this it, entire caution just trying to deal with the whole literally thing. people people ask me why didn't you let us know about the checkered flag sooner because the moment i had everything done is the moment i announced it, it to the world mm-hmm. right. and the safety car happened to be under the bridge driving down the hill the starter didn't even have his checkered flag out for example right right because nobody, nobody knew right. and so it was orchestrated quietly behind the scenes, but yep. not outwardly and publicly where people could either strategize or the yeah, integrity or of the competition, the way it was, okay. was going to be affected. accidentally or whatever it is. Right. So, Twitter, post Petit Le Mans 2015. And this, this is, I don't care about the tweet. I don't think Ryan cares about the tweet either. But it, it speaks to a larger picture. Um, you want to... I was going to say, I, I want to bring it up because I think it's it's important because the one person that was getting called out is really Bo, even though they didn't say Bo. Right. But I do think he kind of answered the question that's coming next is right. that he, you know, he doesn't need to get on Twitter to defend his actions. No, no, no. no. That's not where I'm going. Okay. With this. So, All right. Uh, Post Petit Le Mans, 
Cooper McNeil, who, you know, let's just put it out there. His father <laughs> is WeatherTech, right? Um, puts out this tweet. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know how to not laugh at it. Um, <laughs> that basically says, like, I'm not happy with the race being called, and neither is my old man. And, and uh, you know, essentially saying, oh, you know, our sponsoring family is, is not happy with IMSA right now. Now, I, I don't give a crap about the tweet, and I'm pretty sure you don't either. Um, but... There are, especially with sports car, but but really any series, there, you know, there are so many other factors beyond who's in the car at the time and what's going on. Um, you know, I don't know if you have to deal with that administrative side, but like when when somebody like that calls you out, I know it's not affecting your decision, but yet you have to deal with it. So what happens when when a, you know, I don't care if it's Ed Brown at, at, at Patron or Cooper McNeil with WeatherTech. What happens when these sort of deals go on? I, g- I got an email with that screenshot of the tweet yeah. as soon as it went out. And I looked at it, and uh, somebody else in the commercial side of the business asked me about it soon thereafter. Sure. And and I and I told this person in our organization. I said, you know, it 2002 was the first year I officiated. Yeah. Um, it was 2002 that I implemented my own rule, which is I don't talk to drivers' fathers. <laughs> and 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 I told them. I told them in this case, right. I would make an exception if somebody wants an explanation. Right. Sure. And so if somebody's looking for an explanation, fine. If you want to walk into my office and tell me how to officiate races, right. you're at the wrong place. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and so that happened, and I was curious about it because I've, I just said in kind of the last segment that right. maintaining the integrity <laughs> of the competition was very important to me. Yeah. And I thought we had that pretty well under control. So I looked back at the position that that uh, car in question finished, yeah. and I looked at his last pit stop, yeah. and it would have taken about eight cars to crash oh, we for that car to, to, oh, yeah, to, to go anywhere. To be in the, so, in the hunt. Absolutely. So it was, I, it was, I get it. You have to, you know, you have your frustration. Right. Had the competition played out for another two and a half hours, could that story have been decidedly different? Absolutely. Sure. Um, but in terms of what we're putting forward on track and safety being the guide for what right. we do, I I have n- absolutely no issues with the decision that we made and how that race was managed. Yeah, I mean, I I think if the car had been fighting for the lead in the last hour, and when the checker was thrown out, they were about to see the Magnus car run out of fuel or or, or any car, you know, in front of them, then I could kind of understand some frustration. But I was surprised to see I think the car was six when they yeah it crosses. Didn't make it, yeah. But again, it, to me the the the, the sort of challenge I would imagine you have it, it's I, I don't care about him specifically or that car have it because they were not winning the championship but uh, uh, but you know sports car in particular but this is true for IndyCar NASCAR whoever there are considerations um, that maybe you don't have to make but a lot of people may perceive that you have yeah. to make when it comes to the competition of a race that oh well that guy's dad sponsors a series and, and clearly he's favoring them like wh- how do you deal with that? well and you know you know to to walk back that uh, to an extent the comments that I made earlier if there's a driver, if there's a team owner, if there's a team manager that wants an explanation, right. I'll sit down and walk you through exactly what I did. My right. thought process, what we looked at, how it pertains to the rule book. Um, partners are a little bit different breed because that gets completely out of right. my department and that's dealt with by a completely separate group of people. Sure. But when it starts to get intertwined where you have um, relatives of drivers, yeah. um, you know, then, then I'm willing to sit there and be completely transparent and say, right. here's exactly what we went through. So y- and, you, and you want to honestly look me in the face and say there's not th- that there there isn't a closed room cigars go in session where they go Ferrari has to win absolutely that, not. you're saying that's <laughs> never happened that's weird because I saw on Twitter that totally happens all the time well then so. it must be true <laughs> right uh, I'm, I'm lying right. to you <laughs> so I was kind of explaining to Sean you're uh, you're one of those guys that really appreciates like stuff like you always have cool stuff you got the bikes. I know you've been a watch guy for a long time since I met you. Like the first, I met you actually at the Gold Speed karting track. I was hanging out with Workman, and you drove up in '66 Cadillac. That's right. That was yeah. my, my car of choice back then. Yeah, top down, yeah. stogie out the side. He's like, "What's up, guys?" And I'm like, "Who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> like, what <laughs> is happening here?" I think you might have been wearing like those old like uh, like dress shoes, like with the white fronts. Yeah, yeah. that was <laughs> awesome. It. Absolutely. And I'm gonna guess a wallet chain. 
like a no, you pretty sure? unlikely. I've never no? had a wallet okay. chain. I considered it riding my Harley because I, th- I almost lost my uh, my wallet recently, but <laughs> I don't think I could pull that off. I can pull a lot of stuff off. You get a wallet chain. You get away with it. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, since I met you, you had the you had the Cadillac, you had Agent Orange, which I was surprised you still had. I thought you got rid of that thing. Yep, I'm trying. You know, buyer, I'm this is for sale. <laughs> don't don't stop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I've been like looking for something kind of like that. You know oh, what I want? Man. I want like an old '60s Bronco. 60s Broncos are awesome. Yeah. So I'm looking at Agent Orange right now. What is this? Agent Orange is a 1968 Suburban. The cool thing about a 68 Suburban is it's a three door. So it's got uh, it's got doors on the passenger side, um, a front and back door on the passenger side, but only um, a driver's side door. Um, that's awesome. And that's so like when you're parking on the street in town, the kids can't get out on the on the oh, uh, on the street side. Okay. So um, it's just a unique <laughs> thing, and I saw it and had to have it, and I've had it for ten years oh, now. And now, parent, we've and got the car for yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> no, and it's totally pimped out. It's got uh, like li- you know, it's like a limo feel inside. You right. sit way in the back, gangster style. But uh, when I saw it, I had to have it. And now, ten years later, if I knew of a bridge that went straight down into a ravine, <laughs> <laughs> it, w- it would be there. It's one so of you're those. saying it's priced to sell. <laughs> it is priced to sell. <laughs> But so I've gotten into this motorcycle craze later in my yeah, life, yeah, yeah. and that thing represents about five motorcycles I, that aren't here right now. I hear you. Like so. I, I'm, I'll be looking on Craigslist. I come across like an old Bronco or an old uh, S10 or something or C10, and I'm like, okay, I can get that. Or like three CB 550s. Exactly. Yeah. I I vote for CB 550s. Yeah. I just bought a '73 CB 500. My yep. dad and I are doing up to like a brat style bike. I wanted to bring it to Petit, but it was like just too nasty and not going to be done. So. Oh, nasty is good though. No, the cro- y- chrome and restored vehicles are way overrated. Yeah, no, you're gonna you're gonna like it. Nice. Yeah, so we got we walk in. You've got your uh, a lot of the fans have seen your golf inspired rat rod bike basically, and then you got a Harley, and then a couple other. What, what else you got over there? So you got a Senna bike. Senna bike yeah. is cool. So I've got uh, my '97 Harley, which is kind of stretched out, raked out, big front wheel, all that kind of trend. Um. Shout out to to one of my old racing buddies, Mr. Paul Tracy, for hooking me up with the cool stuff for my bike. Right. Nice. Um, and then I've got a couple of old Honda CBs um, that I just cafeed out. One of them, what is it? Uh, actually, a CX500, which is a really, it's kind of a unique Honda from the mid uh, from the mid 70s. People called it a Honda Guzzi because it's got a it's got a transverse V twin, so the cylinders stick out by your knees. Right. Nice. And it was it was more of a touring bike, shaft drive, water cooled, and a good friend of mine that I reconnected with a few years that uh, I just lost a couple years ago. Um, he told me never do a cafe bike out of a shaft drive water cool <laughs> and so i found that and i was like oh it's on that's what's happening. i'm gonna make this bike badass yeah <laughs> and so when i whenever i start building a bike i want to have some kind of I, I, the word tribute people love it or hate it and I, my bikes are all tribute bikes right sure. and sure. so the golf bike is important because it's got the number 20 which steve mcqueen drove in the yep. movie Le Mans, and that's important to me because it's the very first race car i ever saw in my life when i was four years old oh, watching cool. that on tv so there's that significance i got a um, I got a serious Steve McQueen bromance, as people say. <laughs> um, and and so the cafe bike, when it started to come together, I always wanted to do the John Player special. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And just the black and gold is so yeah. classic. And when I started thinking about that, I'm thinking back to the 70s, like Emerson Fittipaldi and whoever else drove that car. And, and, and it came to me one day um, that pretty much, I mean, so many people's hero in, in this generation of racing is Ayrton Senna. Sure. And it just came to me one day when I was taking it to paint that Ayrton Senna won his first Grand Prix in 1985 yeah. at Estoril in a John Player special. Yeah. And I, it jumped, the number 12 jumped out at me. I knew yeah. he was number 12 that day. So it's my Senna bike. It's got, uh, cool. it's got the number 12. It's got the John Player special. The paint job on it is outrageously awesome. And it had these goofy little reflectors on the side that have uh, th- just where the radiator shroud is. Yeah. These goofy little reflectors. I'm like, what the heck do I do with these? And so I had my pinstriper do the stripes from Senna's helmet on it. And yeah. it's real subtle. And it's just, it's a, it's a perfect tribute. It's a yeah, totally awesome looks really bike. Nice. It's uh, Sunday night. So we got, uh, and in the fall. So we got Sunday night football on. You were talking about watching a little bit earlier. You know, like any fan, we've got calls we do or don't agree with. Do you find yourself more sympathetic? to like an NFL ref or an NBA ref or something like that than you think the average public viewer? Ab- absolutely, because, you know, people people are too quick to 
to hate and question. And the reality is, if you look at your questioning of an official, back up a step because I bet it has a lot more to do with your personal interest in the situation than right. it has to do with any principle, <laughs> any principled right. guidance. Right. And so if you think there's a lame call on TV, it all has to do because your team got a bad call. Yeah. Um, not necessarily because the call itself was bad. And so for me, watching the NFL is, is very intriguing because, okay, there is replay now. Right. And they use it often. But they don't use it every play like we do in right. racing. And so for these guys to make those real-time calls, I'd love to see anybody that questions one of those officials go stand your ass down on yeah. the field and watch this fastest shit action live yeah. Yeah. and make the, call. Make the same call. Make the call. Good luck. Have fun with that. These guys, they're at the top of their game. They, yeah. know, they, they know the deal. It's not just you know some old fat guy that goes stands out there for the hell of it on weekends. Um you know, they know their stuff, and they do a hell of a job. We were actually, we, we just had lunch with Varsha, and, uh, and he was talking about sort of the, that TV relationship between race control and what they catch. And, like, and, and the way he put it is he never wants to be responsible for, you know, somebody's race getting changed because of something he notices that maybe you guys didn't. What is that TV interface like? It's it's fantastic. I just got a call um, two days ago from the producer Greg Oldham Oldham to thank me for you know the efforts that we make in race control to communicate them to communicate with them and keep them in the loop on everything that we do. Yeah. So for me, it's very important because I've been a part of race control teams or I've been a part of race series before where there was this combative relationship between TV and race control. And yeah. it's very unhealthy. Absolutely. Because what are we all You're here supposed to, to be do? working together, sure. We're, we're all, that's exactly what I told them. I said, yeah. it's, you know, you thank me and I, I'm, I'm glad I'm appreciated, but ultimately we're pulling the same direction. Yeah. We, all, we all want this to look good on TV. So whatever my part is in contributing to that, I'm willing to go the extra mile. Um, so it's, uh, you know, we, we have a meeting every single race where I sit in there and talk to, to all the on-air talent and the producers and everything and, and yeah. discuss what we're like, basically go through my driver's meeting notes and talk yeah. about anything that we are planning or anticipating in that event, anything that needs to get wrapped up from the previous event sure. and, and on. So, um, it's a, it's a really <coughs> good relationship. I had, uh, I had a similar relationship with my TV guys, um, the previous three years at IndyCar. So, right. um, I gather from what, from how much both groups have communicated to me that they appreciate what I do, that it's not what they're used to sure. in terms of that officiating interface that they get or right. involvement. Um, are there, uh, things that you can see in the control room that TV can't see or vice versa? Like that. I mean, it's a, it's a very specific question to him, sir, I guess. But yeah. It's interesting to me that once upon a time, when we were, when I first started officiating, when you first start officiating, you have this, um, you have this noble desire to see everything and sure. call everything. Right. And it, frankly, it's impossible. Absolutely. And is that a cop out? No. For my officiating style now, I don't think it's a cop out at all. And I had heard that a certain race series at the time, all they watched was program. So, um, you know, pro program, that means, program, program is the actual TV feed that yeah. the consumer the gets at feed, home. So to speak. Whereas, um, Not you know, the 17 cameras that you can see at any one time. Exactly. Yeah. We have every single one of those cameras live at any given moment rather right. than just program. And it was interesting to me that I heard this group watch program only. And I thought, well, that's lame. What are they going to see? What are they going to catch? Because all they cared about is what the people at home were seeing right. and right. hearing right. and I think there's a lot to that back to an earlier point that I made which is you have to be conscious of the product that you're putting on track right what's it look like what do you want it to look like and so the important part for me to answer your question is that there's things that TV might see that we didn't just right. because of a camera angle or what they're focusing on and they start discussing it and that discussion of what they're putting out on the air doesn't come to us right so we don't have that real feel for the on air or the live product that the consumer at home is seeing and that has been problematic for me in the past where my solution to it was to have one of my stewards listen to program o only because uh, program audio to so know. in one ear they're listening to what the commentators are saying live so if there is anything that we missed that they thought was controversial, sure. we can either send them back a quick explanation or we can ah. say, you know what, there's something that we might have missed. We need to see it because the whole world knows about it and we don't. Yeah. And that sounds like 
either tunnel vision or we're not conscientious in race control. There's just things that get our attention um, that we might be drawn to, focusing on something different than what you see at home that yeah. could very legitimately cause us to miss something. Since so we, we yeah. do this pass it along segment. <laughs> uh, where every guest we have asks the question of the next guest. And so very very much along those lines, when we told, when we told Bob that you were our, our next guest, uh, he had a, a very specific question related to this for you. you have it with you? Yeah, so uh, Bob's question. Yeah, so Bob's question was, uh, what is the one thing that TV announcers do that drives you crazy? <laughs> hmm. And he wasn't specific to sports car racing or, yeah. or racing in general. I wonder, if so. I wonder if he's trying to bait me to throw down on Calvin Fish or something. <laughs> so, yes. S let's assume he is. <laughs> no. Nah, yeah, Calvin, <laughs> Calvin was in that group at Mid-Ohio. We go way back. We, uh, I, I, I always like to, to uh, give Calvin a, Calvin a shot when I, when I can, but uh, he's a good dude. You know, it, it, this is a difficult question because, honestly, um, honestly, I've worked such a good relationship with those guys that there's nothing that commonly consistently happens that really sticks out in my mind. What I do have difficulty with is sometimes they'll go too far down the path of much like we talked about fans basing everything off their own personal beliefs or sure. opinion rather than what the rule book says or what we explain we're going to do. Um, I think it's fair. It's absolutely fair and appropriate for a commentator to interject an opinion but then you have to back that up with the facts of why the officials are calling it that way or base it on what the rule book says or what was discussed in a driver's yeah. meeting. I see that happen too often. And, you know, there's a right and wrong way to do it. If that opinion is backed up with all the things I said, fine. If it's just put out there for the sake of stirring the pot, that's not doing us any good. And, 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 I, and I'm saying that really uh, – I'm saying it more from a race control perspective – than I am anything else. Yeah. Um, too many people think just controversy is okay, but when the controversy <coughs> is, is reflected on the series itself, then it weakens the series Absolutely. and people get turned off of it. Yeah. And so I've seen that happen too often that's very disappointing and frustrating. Sure. Whereas, you know, if two cars got together, for example, and it was a questionable situation, yeah. it, there was a culture too long in IndyCar where it's, oh, race control should have done this. You know what? Why are you making it about race control yeah. when the reality is it's between these two drivers? Yeah. What does this mean about these two drivers going forward contesting the championship or what payback might be at the next race? That's the controversy people want to hear, not, yeah. oh, the series screwed it up again. Right. Well, and, and you can take that exact same situation and you can make it a positive positive or you can take it a negative yeah. and I think too often uh, TV from my experiences miss, misses some of those opportunities 2012 was a sort of a new era for IndyCar new car um, Brian Barnhart had uh, was no longer with the series uh, and and uh, or at least not in that capacity I not in that say. capacity yeah, yeah, excuse me um, you know Randy Bernard was kind of now in what we would consider sort of his prime uh, in terms of having control of that series. And here comes this this sports car guy. It seemed to me from the outside that it probably wasn't the most pleasant experience to be a part of. Um, my, my time there, um, I think, was very productive. Um, I look I look at it as a as an absolute success. Yep. Um, there were controversial calls, um, and I think more to, to my earlier point. I think it was more of a controversial philosophy or maybe the lack of acknowledgement of a true officiating philosophy that's going to guide this series into the future. Yeah. And uh, and I came in with a, a, a less involved approach of overmanaging the competition on track. And that was received well and it went well and we did have a couple controversies and you're going to have them. But overall uh, the time there was it was uh it was successful. It was good. It was positive for me. It's what I wanted to do. Um, it's what I felt like in terms of where my career path had taken me. Yeah. I was the right guy for the job. Right. And, and you know, it, it, with management changes, that just completely collapsed. Okay. <laughs> so can I interpret that, please, or no? Or are you going to shut me down? I, I so figured I'd put it out there to see if you had any more questions. So, <laughs> let, let me, so who else left... <laughs> So, 
I, I'm guessing you and you and Randy obviously got along pretty well. Randy um, was a good leader. He left yeah. me to do my thing. You know, he's 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 the guy that's the executive that understands the commercial aspects and right. and the outside the box way of thinking that's going to drive this series into the future. Right. Not be not meddle and micromanage the officiating. Right. He he wouldn't know much about what that was going to entail. Right. So he. You know, he, he had his questions. He needed his explanations. But other than that, I was completely empowered to do the job that they hired me to do. And he was effectively let go by the controlling board of, of the series. Um, what do you think the reasoning was behind that? And uh, if you don't want to answer, don't answer. Well, I mean, un unfortunately... Um, yeah, there's just too many politics at yeah, play, yeah, yeah. and and there were some there were some things happening behind the scenes, business wise, sure. that concerned a lot of people, and, uh, and and I think it was a concern to the extent that the few people that started to bring it to light, right? Um, you know, it it just grew legs, got right. uh, got blown out of proportion. From what I understood at the time, uh, Randy had said some things about not necessarily being too interested in in extending his contract, sure. and so all that kind of played in, and and. Sure. And it's a damn shame because I think if he were still there, um, it would be potentially in better condition than it is now. Sure. Derek Walker just left IndyCar. Um, seemed, of course, after he decides he's leaving, it seems to be universally pretty liked and respected. Um, is, is there sort of an atmosphere within the IndyCar paddock that makes it very, if you're in a, you know, a neutral position such as a race official, a technical director, whatever it is, is there a, an atmosphere in that series that's particularly rough compared to others? I think it is, and and it's amazing to me that um, as the series, the two series unified and became this, Which this was supposed to be a happy time. Well, it was supposed to be a happy time, but there's so many people loved Cart and what it yeah. was and what it did, yeah. and what it did poorly was let too many people be involved in the decision process. Yep. And that culture is still a massive hangover in IndyCar today. Okay. And there's this feeling of entitlement from too many people about what needs to happen. How does it need to work? What does it need yep. to look like? And good luck getting those 20 or 30 people to agree on yeah, anything, right. right? And as and opposed to Twitter followers, these people have a stake. Yeah. So they have to be listened to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So. Um, so there's that uh, there's that culture that really still drives, and you know, truthfully, a big part of it is how many IndyCar team owners are really making money off of IndyCar. Right. And so when you look at that, then even if you didn't necessarily embrace the cart model of yeah. franchises and votes and all yeah. that kind of stuff, you still have have to be to some extent sympathetic. To, and, and this goes for any race series, sure. but you really have to be sympathetic when you know these guys are fully invested. Right. And and what's their what's their benefit at the end of the day? Right. They love it and they want to see it succeed. For you know whether whether that's going to drive them to good decisions or sure. not so sure. good decisions, you have to say you know what they're vested enough that we have to sit down and we have to have this conversation and we have to listen and we have to be responsive. Right. So it's just a difficult situation because the model is really completely broken right now. In 2013, Grand Am had to ban a, a DP driver for a race or two um, who had some speed but was doing a lot of reckless things. You know, he was a funded driver that was helping keep that team afloat, um, but they had to make the decision to kick him out. But that has a direct effect on one of your stakeholders in a team. Um, obviously, you need to make a decision for safety and integrity, but at the same time, that if, if, a, if a funded driver is banned, that has a very serious implication on its team owner. Um, does that ever play into what you guys do? I mean, I'm sympathetic towards it because I understand that uh, some of these decisions affect people's business and livelihoods and such. Yeah. But ultimately, like I said, with, with safety being our primary guide, it doesn't put me in a different position. That's, yeah. uh, it, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to cop out of this, but that's kind of an abro uh, above my pay grade decision. Somebody <laughs> else, somebody else is going to have to sort that out. That's totally fair. Right. If I see somebody that's jackass on track, I'm going to have to take action and how right. that affects other people down the road, then that has really to be sorted be with after I take right. my action. Well, I know with a couple of the deals I've done, uh, driver contracts have stated that if I'm banned for whatever reason and I had a sponsorship related to the program, the sponsorship would continue throughout the period that we signed the contract, whether I'm in the car or not. So on one hand, yeah, these guys probably need to think, hey, I don't want to 
kick someone out and have someone's livelihood be affected team owner wise but at the same time the team owner should be the one saying hey if you do something stupid and you get kicked out your sponsorship still continues for this program yeah. throughout that weekend and we're going to put whoever we want in right. to make the difference so I think that's not necessarily a race control thing but I, I understand it's, but it's, it's, I don't, it's I don't definitely really still a thought process right. for sure I don't you know penalizing people is not the joy of my job it's not something are you sure? I thought it was are you sure no, I hold, thought on, I read. hold on I've got a point here I got a point here <laughs> I had a great point let here. me finish so <laughs> it's just not one of those things that you appreciate and that's what you know you that's the main thing you're there to do but sure. after Ryan tells the story it's in his contract I want to be the guy that bans him for a race so he's got to watch somebody else drive his race car yeah that would just be awesome oh that'd be good Boom. for you yes. you'd enjoy that yeah I think Boom. I would I bet you would yeah <laughs> I was talking to Sean on the way here about like things I want to know and I w <laughs> how often so uh, your right hand man in race control is uh, my right hand man is Paul Walter Paul Walter thank you so and 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 I, I gotta say that that sounds like a disservice the guy as a support and with his intelligence and his knowledge of the rules and his presence everything is just yeah i couldn't ask for a better guy i like paul fantastic. when he was in our series the last couple of years i honestly think they had him a little bit overrun on things he was supposed to be doing so i think you guys are a good partnership my my question to sean on the way here when we were just kind of bsing about things that to converse about how many times do you look at paul off you know not on mic and just say did you see that what an idiot like how many times a weekend does that have in the various series Countless. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> got to be just I mean, like because I answer. see stuff on track, and sometimes I do stuff on track, and I'm like, oh no, man, what? I can't believe I'm allowed to do this. Did anybody see that? Yeah, we uh, y y we talked about how calm I am earlier, and I keep it. Besides calm, I keep it fun and funny and race control. Just keep everybody engaged with loose, what's going on. Sure, yeah. Real, very loose. Um, and I can I can keep it loose because the people that we have in race control are the best. I mean, just the best. Everybody has their specific task, and they do it very, very, very well. And um, so we keep it light, and we watch these things, and we see stuff happen. So, yeah, we, we, we try to have fun with it. Yeah, yep. that's good to know. I'll uh, keep that in mind when I'm we, um, throwing it off the road. There were at least two – you talked about instant message earlier, which, again, yeah. is just our direct private with every team manager in the uh, – yeah in the pit lane and, and only they can see it at least a couple of times there was a simple WTF instant <laughs> message sent from race control <laughs> what's it, I supposed it, to do it, it happens and <laughs> and when you get no response you know they know exactly what you're talking about just like a 10-4 <laughs> if, if, if you send a WTF and you get three question marks back then it requires some kind of explanation but when it's just crickets it's like okay message received yeah, I, think, I yeah. think that won't happen now again we'll move forward <laughs> yeah next <laughs> that's excellent so, because it's Ryan and the guy who does a lot of the Magnus stuff, you're probably the only IMSA official that will ever be on this. Um, not in the sense that we would love to have more IMSA, but I'm, you know, whatever. So I want to, I want to, I want you to, to represent IMSA on one very salient issue. <laughs> I read this on Twitter all the time. Are you sure that when you guys are in race control? Are, is, is Brian France and Mike Helton in there saying, how can we <coughs> Wow. I actually is have a real question. <laughs> Serious. No, this is, this is a big thing, and I, and I even joked about it. Were you at all concerned, and it kind of goes to Sean's joke, that letting a GT LM car win overall against the DPs, which are the France family's creation and obviously our main thing, were you concerned at all that there would be a phone call saying, hey, why did we let that happen? Um, you know, is there anything we could have done differently? Because I think it ultimately comes down to, like, an open tire rule versus a spec tire rule kind of helped that GT LM car be so good in the rain. For me, yeah. watching, watching the race unfold, it didn't even factor in for me. Sure. Right. Um, it, much to not – not looking too much at car color or driver names or, you know, classes, this, that, or the other. From the way we officiated that race and the conditions that we have, it played out the way it was supposed to on sure. the track. Mm -hmm. And whatever that looks like, if we're supposed to be involved or make decisions to change that, <coughs> excuse me, I didn't, I didn't get anything. Right, I right. Well, I honestly was 
happy that a GTLM car did win because I read some of the crap that people put online sometimes yeah. where it's completely a conspiracy theory. Yeah, exactly. NASCAR's out to kill everything. And that drives me nuts. And, of course, like like you said, Mike Helton. And, yeah, they're sitting uh, there in race control. They're clearly. standing next to you like, to, hey, Bo, know. why'd you do that? Yeah. Let the DP win. That is or, how it works, or whatever. isn't it? Um, I've, I've seen Mike Helton three times this year. One time was uh, I went up to his office in Daytona to introduce myself when I was new. <laughs> and you've been here how um, long? The, 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 no, this was early oh, on okay. in the year. Okay. This was probably okay. about a year ago, oh, okay. actually. It was cool. at the end of last year. Sure. So I, I'm saying in the last 12-month okay. period. Sure. And uh, the next time, he did a quick walk through, visit the 24-hour, basically make sure everybody's awake. Right. And I don't mean that like, hey, are you doing your job? Like, hey, anybody need a coffee? <laughs> cool? Yeah. Sort right, of right, thing. Right. Um, which I, I saw him and didn't even speak a word to him. He was sure. in. He was out. And then uh, I saw him across the, the room at the banquet a couple of nights ago. Um, he's assured me when I met him briefly that uh, whatever whatever we need in terms of support or whatever we've got, um, hands off to the extent that we're able to do our job. Right. Um, I've had I've had conversations. Um, so you have the audacity I've to claim that NAS <laughs> that IMSA could benefit from NASTAR's resources because that's crazy talk. Here's the thing. <laughs> I've been. <laughs> I've been to Champ Car when it was at independently its own deal, and when it blew through $60 yeah. million dollars in one year. Awesome. Um, I've, been, <laughs> I've been in IndyCar where, you know, business-wise, we've got, you know, we had, we had financial issues just because yeah. the business is upside down. Yeah. Um, and then I come to this NASCAR-held IMSA. Yeah. And... You know, everybody's got their negative negativity, their conspiracy theories. Right. And for for what I felt in champ car offices and what I felt in indie car offices, yeah. the the stability and the controlling in Absolutely. a good way presence yeah. that you feel when you're in Daytona is extremely comforting for a guy like me. Yeah. No in doubt. terms of knowing that you can do something for a long time if you don't really completely do screw job. it up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, knowing that you've got backup and support if it doesn't go great and the resources that you talked about in terms of some of the stuff that we've talked about with development and crash testing, this, that, right. and the other. Uh, we did a lot of crash testing at, at IndyCar and it was expensive and yeah. it was debilitating <laughs> because financially we, were, we weren't in a great place. But what that means for us and what we have access to um, with, uh, I think they call it the Technology Center up, at, yeah. up in Charlotte. Right. It's, it's, it's a great presence. It's yeah. very positive. I haven't encountered anything negative on that side. Yeah, and I think that's not what I read on Twitter. Well, right. Uh, there was a Facebook page that said you're wrong. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, that out. And so, yeah. Yeah, for all the times I get called wrong, I, I, I believe it. So, let's uh, stop talking about racing. Sorry, yeah, I, I always drag it down. It's boring. Um, you used to have a bus. I did. What happened to that bus? Oh, man, the bus. <laughs> Actually, I was I was started telling somebody this story the other day because we were talking about putting uh, putting a turbo diesel in the back of the of the, of the orange oh, beast. Asian orange, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the bus, I sold it. And, um, and it was like a it was like a Prevo, like an older yeah, an older it, it just conversion, yeah. like like an old MCI bus that was converted into this ma this monster motorhome, total kind of uh, monster garage style. But that's beside the point. So this thing um, got some mods, got sold um, to a friend of mine actually that lived in California, and the guy he hired a guy to jump in and and drive it to him, three thousand miles cross country, and. Literally, the thing was sitting up in uh, up in Jackson, Jackson County, Georgia. So they're going down 85, headed towards Atlanta, and the air system malfunctions. No big deal, right? Except that the air controls the throttle, and s for some reason the fail safe was that it went full <laughs> throttle. Um, it controls. It, yeah. it well, as you do. You right? don't want to walk away from the crash. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's got to be fine, all right. Obviously, on a bus like that, it controls the brakes. <laughs> And obviously the fail safe <laughs> wasn't for the brakes to engage. It was for them to no longer function. Right. And, oh, lo and behold, it also controlled the kill switch. So they couldn't shut the power off to the thing. So now, and, and also I think the governor 
Why not? No. Why not? Sure. Just throw that in there just for <laughs> just for good measure and storytelling. So, you know, the fastest I ever got the damn thing going downhill was like maybe 68. Right. And this dude's doing 90 down 85 headed into Atlanta oh, traffic. Might as well oh. be on fire. Yeah. No, it, he wishes. <laughs> <laughs> he'd, have been, he'd have been happier if it was. So no brakes, full throttle, you know, all the bad stuff. And, you know, he's... As the story goes, he pulled off one off ramp just to see if he could do something, yeah. and like just completely like dukes speed. a hazard yeah. over uh-huh. the off ramp and back down the on ramp and got back on eighty five and couldn't figure out how to stop it or to do anything. He's calling his family to tell him goodbye. Right, right. I mean, like it's uh, a dramatic plane, ugly situation. Yeah, 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 yeah. And down. so he finally laid the thing over. Um, <laughs> wow. In, in the in the median. <laughs> <laughs> just let's recap for a second. <laughs> let's you laid the thing driving. over. It's not a motorcycle. Like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a tour it bus. Was, uh, like it's a bus. You know, it's kind of one of those. It's like a boat, the happiest two days of a boat owner's life, the day you buy it, the day you sell it. Right. I'm glad that thing was out of my possession, but I'm just so pissed I wasn't there to experience just to that see whole it. thing. Just to see <laughs> it. Because I would have just been like, cigar lit, I'm headed to Atlanta. <laughs> here it goes. Here, here we go. <laughs> Feet up on the dash. Yeah, like, totally. All right, this is it. It's been a good one. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when you were telling us that story at, at the school one day. We were just like, <coughs> crying, laughing. Believe it or not, the thing still made it to California. No and way. It, and it lives with its uh, owner that acquired it from me over 10 years ago. Wow. Wow. Mm-hmm. Man. He was okay, obviously. Apparently. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. I'm scarred for <laughs> life emotionally, yeah. apparently. Hates Atlanta. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you got into guitars... When I first met you, I don't remember you being really into them at all, and you've recently got into them. Not at all. In fact, um, it's you idiots that would have these parties at Andy's right. house, and we'd play Guitar Hero, and I was like, well, that's totally cool, and I love rocking out, but I need to get a real guitar. Right. Funny enough, back in those days, um, for some of the stuff that – the way the whole story plays out from its roots is that Guitar Hero was definitely a latch from you guys, yeah. which is totally awesome. I think uh, Foss got us into it, and then I, like, couldn't put it down. No, it was ridiculous. <laughs> and then so <coughs> so after that, and that same time, the, the programs that we did at Paint Us, we did for year one. And that's, that's right. why I ended up buying the Orange Beast Oh yeah, because yeah, yeah. I had to have a 60s vehicle. Year one provides aftermarket equipment for re- restorations okay. for every 60s and 70s vehicles you, you can imagine. And one of their guys that they were supporting big time back then was Chip Foose. That's right. okay. And funny how this is going to lead to a guitar story, but <laughs> Chip Foose did a big charity fundraiser poker tournament. So okay. it was the poker thing. Right. It was the whole... The, there was the whole thing. One of their other guys that they supported, like Chip Foose, was Kenny Wayne Shepherd. Okay. So I went to this uh, this charity poker function in Georgia, and our gift was uh, a Fender Strat. Oh, nice! And so that thing just hung on my wall yeah, forever. Yeah, like a trophy. Yeah. And I moved back. To, uh, that was when I was still living in in Georgia, and I moved back to Texas. And I was sitting here after I got a lot of work done on this place after I bought it. And I'm like, I need to, I need a new something to do. Right. And I picked up that guitar and started playing it. And that was six years ago. And now 15 guitars later. Sure. Yeah. And uh, drum sets and yeah. amps. and. The first thing I saw when everything. I walked in, I was like, okay, I see a rifle, a pool table, <laughs> and guitars and a drum set. Welcome. I'm, I'm home. Welcome to Texas, son. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Texas. Where's my room? What else? Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's guns <laughs> elsewhere, but, you know, don't let that be a threat. Or is that politically correct to talk about? I think in Texas you can say whatever you want. Yeah. To anybody. Damn right. <laughs> Jesus. It's about time. It's the way it should be. So the guitar thing, it's funny because uh, I reconnected with my buddy Tony a few years back that uh, that just left. He His son, same thing, guitar hero. Um, 18 years old, self-taught, and this guy absolutely, absolutely rocks. Yeah. And so he just laughs at us. He won't even help us. We're just a lost cause right. for him. He's like, don't, don't even waste, waste my time. time. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but And then meanwhile, I reconnected with another friend of mine who, funny enough, we were really good friends in high school because he knew I was a car guy and he knew I was going to be a racer. And we hung out because of his car thing. And then as we lost touch for 20 years and then our paths reconverged, he started a Pink Floyd cover band. Of course. Yes. And it is totally awesome. And he lives up in, in Dallas and kind of does some stuff all over Texas and Louisiana. But between my friend Tony's son and Tony plays and this friend of mine and his Pink Floyd with his Pink Floyd cover band, 
Um, I completely latched on to David Gilmour okay. um, because he's just the most rocking guitarist in my yeah. mind and uh, for skill, talent, and just his own thing. So I've told people, actually, I don't get starstruck. I've met a lot of really cool people in my sure. life. But if I saw David Gilmore in the flesh, I would cry like a schoolgirl. <laughs> I, gar- I guarantee you. I guarantee you. I couldn't Excuse control me, myself. <laughs> yeah. You sign my panties? I mean, wait, yeah, whatever. I, yeah. yeah, I can get some. Yeah, right. For you. <laughs> exactly. yeah, whatever you like. Anything you want, sir. So uh, so we, we play, and I'm a total hack, but I love it. And I figured some stuff out. And I uh, just totally self taught. Haven't taken any lessons. Just. Uh, listen to Pink Floyd and it sounds like I'm in my sunroom doing a lot of drugs listening to Pink Floyd but Pink Floyd was just a thing that I kind of latched on to later in life and especially when I started playing guitar because you hear what goes on there and it's like wow the appreciation and for wow. it wow yeah, unbelievable it it better. Yeah. and then your buddy's got the, the cover band too so yeah, yeah. Um, I actually got to get up um, on stage nobody was there except the band uh, at House of Blues a couple of weeks ago, and and play while they were doing their sound check, oh, and it was awesome. just like the acoustics it, had to have been. just his band was up there, and some friends were down down in the pit, and there was nobody in there because it was pre-show, and I played, and I've never been so nervous in my sure, life. Like yeah, nobody absolutely. gave a crap, right. nobody was whatever. Yeah, don't even <laughs> but some of the band guys came up to me afterwards, and they were like, "Man, you sounded pretty good." I was like, "Yeah, rock on." So did right. you play the one thing you can play like no problem, or did you just like oh just free you know just do whatever here, or were you like I got to play Mary Had a Little Lamb? So that's so my jam. <laughs> Mary had a little lamb. No, no, it was all no. And the cool thing for respect from them is I played a bunch of my Pink Floyd nice, stuff. So, nice. so uh, Travis, my friend, was up on stage setting up, and he's got this Echoplex, which is an echo thing that Gilmore used back in the day. And I heard some stuff from it. My ears gotten really good from playing guitar. And I walked up to the stage. I'm like, "Is that right? Is that whatever?" And he's like, "No, I got a major problem." But he's like, "Come up here and play some stuff." Oh, that's cool. So I stepped yeah. up there. And uh, he had just played uh, Run Like Hell. So I went through my Run Like Hell thing. And then uh, he plays the solo from Mother. So I played that. And then my absolute all-time fave, which I could just sit and play over and over again, is the solo from Time. Okay. And I, I went through that whole thing. And the right. keyboardist was like, Dan, you played that a few times. And I was, I was like, yeah, it's now <laughs> complete now. Some right? sort of recognition. <laughs> yeah. Right? And your answer yeah. was like, no, I've never. Yeah. yeah. It's my yeah. first time. Yeah. So I've never done that. Of course, you had to play like with footwork. Like, yeah, it's yeah. a deal. Yeah, 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 so I whipped out the <laughs> I knew it wasn't going to be like, <laughs> yeah, you know. Try something new here with this uh, huge room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, negative. No, but it was with all the equipment that they have for that. They've got like probably 50,000 in equipment with all their sure. music stuff and right. lasers and everything. Right. So playing out there, it was just totally uh, cool. That would be really cool. Totally yeah. cool. Yeah. So how are we going to get you on a guitar here? What's the deal? We could probably make that happen. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah, we, uh, Good. When we walked in, you guys, I mean, it seemed like you guys were just having your own little jam session. Yeah. Is that is that just Sunday night here? Is that yeah, every night here? Yeah, it happens. We, uh, I could probably, uh, yeah, we could we can make it happen depending on what your your recording capabilities are, we which can seem pretty vast. We, uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's a it's a laptop. Yeah, it's yeah. A, it's, <laughs> it's this is a multi million hey, dollar. That's actually so the, that's this, actually your can- candle. This, that's yours. Yeah. This yeah. Oh, you didn't bring that. <laughs> no, that's your candle. Yeah. This headset it's I got on is pretty high tech. Yeah, it's though. not yeah. too bad, right? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you just just start thinking about how to hook that up because we'd love to have that kind of as a thing for our show. Okay, cool. So, what does a race director do from now until, you know, until the 24 hour for your yeah, schedule? I assume it's just a three month vacation, really. I mean, you just pretty much <coughs> lay by the pool. You do nothing and you show up at the 24. Yeah, um, <coughs> as little as possible, really. <laughs> I hear you. There's, yes. uh, so, not much has changed. I've yes. got. Uh, I got the I got the cabin built over here a yeah, few years ago, which is awesome. Uh, awesome. This this that we're sitting in right now is phase two, so that was this time last year actually. Pretty much broke ground on this a year ago. Okay. Yeah. So stuff like this happens when you come back next year. If you do, there might be some shit built over there. Yeah, why not? Um, he just declared a season two. Yeah, he's on season two. <laughs> he's on season oh, two. Oh yeah, because it's gonna happen. I'm on. We got to. You got to follow up with some of this stuff. Right, like, dude, what were you like, thinking? <laughs> remember <laughs> when you <laughs> said that <laughs> and it <laughs> happened? Dude, exactly. Sebring, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> now, in all seriousness, um, I do. 
Um, I'm fortunate to be able to, to stay home and not uh, have to go to somebody's office every yeah. day, but I will spend a good bit of time in Daytona. I actually sure. just got an email this morning. It was pretty much you guys' fault because I sent my <laughs> boss a message to say, hey, I'm doing this thing. I think yeah. it's funny I'm, that you I'm, actually... I'm, I'm doing this thing, and yeah. it's going to go out to the public, so I just wanted you to be aware of it, <laughs> yeah. right? So there's no surprises. And then how does he respond? Yeah, no problem, but I need you in Daytona in two weeks. I'm like, damn it. No, uh, wait, oh, wait. Yeah. No, and, 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 and I say that... Um, I'm I'm not an office guy. I'm not an everyday guy. But uh, Paul and I will show yeah. up in the office yeah. in Daytona probably no less than four or five times between now and Christmas for, yeah. for four or five days at a time, and we will get work done. It'll be mainly rule book stuff and planning yeah. for mm -hmm. 2016. And uh, so I'll be there a good bit, just not every day. And that's not smoke and mirrors. I mean, we went on the Magna side. We, there was a, was a – yeah, it was a November test. It was a private test uh, last November and between getting back to the hotel, showering, and the whole thing, I don't think we sat down to eat at uh, Carabas or whatever just across the street. And it was probably like 11 at night. And as we were leaving, so it's like 40 minutes in, uh, Paul Walter walks in having just left the office. And he was saying, ah, it's been like two all-nighters or whatever it was. And and uh, it sounds like this this is the deal when you guys show up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for for off season stuff, it's not near as strenuous as the yeah. race events themselves. Yeah. There's no harder working man in motorsports than Paul Walter. Yeah. I mean, so to go back to him. Uh, so during tests and, and race events, he'll yeah. put in the hours. The guy just he's a machine. He doesn't need sleep. Yeah. Um, I try not to take advantage of that, but when I can sleep for an extra hour, knowing that he's going to be at the track at 6 a.m. and I don't have to roll until <laughs> 7, it's kind of <laughs> nice. But uh, that's on record. Uh, well, at least he, yeah, there you go. He's honest. <laughs> nah, but we put in hours. I mean, I, I I'll be at the track um, in this role for 14 or 16 hours a day, sure. easy. And yeah. man, it, it's it's no problem. It's not uh, it's not grueling. It's engaging and and it's challenging and it's fun so uh he just he always takes it to the extra the the, ex the next level with imsa being now you know a nascar corporation is there any goals for you to move into that direction in stock car stuff is that something long term you'd want to maybe just try or is it just like you're loving what you're at now and it's all good or is there any sort of here's the so i was a driver and then i ended up teaching and I kind of did that on purpose, but just because I wanted to be around racing. Right. And then that led to coaching. And then somehow all of that teaching program management stuff led to officiating. I didn't mean for that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, officiating led me from Formula Ford 2000 to Champ Car to ALMS to IndyCar. There were some of those things that I had in mind that I kind of wanted to do, but <coughs> I didn't say, that's the job I've got my okay. eye on. That's yeah. what I want to do. I'm totally go with the flow. Sure. I love doing what I'm doing right now, and I could do it for 20 years. If somebody wants me to do something different, You'll tell, listen to tell me what you got. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And, and does that mean I'm looking for deals to, to exit what I've got right now? No. I love doing this. I plan on doing it for a long time. If there's a different position within that organization, IMSA, NASCAR, that somebody wants me to do, then tell me what you got. Yeah, you'll hear them out. So it's not uh, – I've never – I've never been a big promoter of myself in terms of that's my aspiration and that's what I'm trying to do. Um, it just just work hard and good things happen. And you've always got hungries if it doesn't work. I got that. Yeah, so you can go absolutely. Back there. Yeah, they know me. They say hi to me every time I come in there. There you go. So we have a couple of promotional things. Uh, yeah, we get. So we're going to Jeff Brown tomorrow. Yeah, Colin's dad, guy that runs the Speed Source deal. You know. Him. Yeah, I've heard of him. Okay. Okay. So. What do you got for him? What's a, yeah, what's a question? There's one question you could ask him. Well, I said I've heard of him tongue-in-cheek. <laughs> Jeff, <Brown, laughs> Jeff Brown is one of the most professional uh, guys that I've encountered in the paddock. He, he can, uh, so he can, why did he say yes to us? He can give, he can give feedback. Um, he could have a lot of emotion. He's an engineer, so he doesn't. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> I, maybe I discount that. Um, he's a genuinely down-to-earth good guy that's there for the better cause of motor racing. Yeah. I have tremendous respect for the guy. So and, that's not and, a question. And so I uh, copy that. And so <laughs> I just want I want to I want to set up my question. And so for what he does and the people that he's worked with and his history and his talent, I hold in exceptionally high regard. And he started talking to me about doing motorcycle track days and oh. one thing i've never had interest in is taking a motorcycle on a racetrack and he's a big motorcycle track until guy. Yeah. an intelligent 
humble guy like Jeff Brown says, come do this. Yeah. And the first thing I did when I got home is I started preparing my two-stroke uh, Yamaha for, awesome. for track days. All because of him. And it hasn't happened, but he and I will do a track day in the not-too-distant future. Okay. And so with what I know about Jeff on the racing side and his more private world of motorcycles, I'm genuinely curious to know from Jeff, do the guys that you ride motorcycles with during your track days know your capabilities, skill, and talent for what you do on four wheels? Hmm. I like that. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. And that's yeah. very specific to him. He's just going to say, no. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that's probably it. Yeah. And that just speaks to the to the humility of the guy. He yeah. just quietly does his thing, and he does it very well. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I think we need to get you on a guitar. Yeah. yeah. Let's make it happen. But in the meantime, Continental's got the check. Meow. Field, playing us out, dinner with racers on our way to see Jeff Braun. <laughs>